Hello, everyone. Are you ready? I hope you have a good day. Uh, it was a successful day for all of you. You had fun. You enjoyed. You weren't a lonely document. You um, connected with almost everyone, hopefully, uh, in a good way. Um, we are now having the final act of, of the day. Um, I'm happy to now announce uh, Jim Weber doing the final keynote of GraphConnect Europe 2017. Give him up. Thank you, my brother. Hello. There's a lot of you out there. This is rather intimidating. Um, look, what? Look, plus, look, excellent day, right? Absolutely excellent day. Um, so I work in a little corner of the Neo4j software stack normally. Occasionally they let me out to re me meet real people, but mostly I'm pinned in a little corner of the Neo4j software stack. So I've learned an absolute shed load today. Um, I've met, had wonderful corridor conversations with several of you, but not enough. I've seen some outstanding uh, presentations from Neo4j folks, community folks, customers. I'm particularly uh, pleased that about a year ago, I uh, uh, basically yelled at Andy from KCOM that he should do the trains as a graph, and this year he's presenting. That felt like kind of uh, a good thing. And so I've just learned today an awful lot. And if I'm just distill for you what I've learned, and then kind of do top K. And if I was to reduce that to the most important thing that I've learned, I'd just say it's this. Never annoy your marketing team. Because if you do, they put Jimmy stupid face <laughs> on your slides and on dozens of other people's slides. So thank you very much, marketing team. You did indeed have the last laugh. <laughs> so you think. <laughs> so look, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about graphs. I'm going to talk a bit about computer uh, architecture and stuff. But here we are, Westminster, the seat of civilization and democracy. So just let me take one minute. Just one minute. So Emerald did the kind of arm raising this morning. How many of you guys have come from the European Union today? <laughs> outside, of Great, outside of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, we are still a part of the European Union, of course. So to you guys with your arms still up, thank you for coming to your last Graph Connect London. It's been, <laughs> it's been lovely having you over here. Um, if you're coming next time, I suggest grappling hooks. Maybe your best bet. So, uh, all right. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I work for a Silicon Valley boss. Hey, Emil. <laughs> and he's not at all pleased that I kick off these kind of things with some outrageous and in, you know, inappropriate politics. He's all like, look, you know, you should get out there, talk about this, like, amazing, like, Silicon Valley-led technology that we deliver from Silicon Valley in a Silicon Valley way with a Silicon Valley ethos. Don't worry about all that austerity and criminality and fascism. That's not something you get to say often on stage. Do the Silicon Valley thing. Oh, man, he's a boss, isn't he? He's got a hoodie and everything. Um, <laughs> all right, boss. Game on. I see you. He's grimacing, by the way. If you're, if you're looking for the facial expression, it's a grimace. Isn't it about time someone puts some venture back in venture back to graph database company? Oh, yeah. How many of you guys have seen the Silicon Valley series on TV, by the way? Okay, you're going to get this. Most of you are going to be looking blankly at me for the next 30 or so minutes, and that's okay. When the people who've seen the dumb TV show laugh, laugh along so you don't feel embarrassed. That's, that's the way we're going to work through this, okay. Uh, don't you think Mark Needham looks lovely with hair, actually? <laughs> I think, uh, I, I think uh, you know, um, he deserves a, a wig. And, uh, you know, what do you reckon? Do you think I can carry that off? I've got the shirt for it. I've certainly got the bad attitude. So, actually, this is the key, this is the key that I really want to give. Graph insanity. Um, where it, because there are several board members in the room, insanity in this context means scientifically responsible jubilation. So... What are we really going to talk about? <laughs> it took me about six months to work out GIMP to put the Neo4j logo on that slide, slide, by the way. If you're wondering why I haven't been terribly productive committing to Neo4j, that's why. We're going to have a little bit of a recap about where we've been. I think the, the 3.x series of Neo4j has been really very interesting, actually. Uh, it set some really important foundations in place. Then I want to have a look at hardware. 
I know, right? Like actual hardware, which we take for granted, and we just, they're just boring beige boxes that we never consider. But actually, hardware's got interesting again. I think this is quite an in, uh, uh, important uh, trend to watch from a kind of database point of view. And I want to then kind of uh, 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 see how uh, advances in hardware marry up with uh, the way that we build Neo4j. So how, because we build Neo4j top to bottom for graph workloads, how we can take advantage of some of those uh, really quite interesting hardware trends and see what the confluence of modern hardware and modern native graph tech looks like. Uh, I think it looks pretty good. And then we'll take a look out uh, uh, to the future, uh, yeah, where we're, where we're uh, uh, going in, uh, with, with Neo4j now, medium and, and slightly longer term. And then we can drink the pain of this keynote away. Is that kind of a deal? Is that the social contract? Yeah, yeah, yeah good, good, good. Sounds great. Um, so, <laughs> consider the bulldog, as Gavin said. Um, what have Neo4j people been doing with Neo4j contributors on Neo4j since we last met at the Neo4j conference to talk about Neo4j things at Neo4j Graph Connect? Um, in reference to inbreeding of the bulldog there, but what have we been up to? Let's have a recap of what we've been up to uh, over uh, the, the, the 3.x series of releases. 3.0, uh, last year uh, in London, uh, we released it, and the premise was that this was going to be the, uh, was the uh, enterprise foundation for graphs. So on the architectural side, we uh, demolished some uh, limits in the amount of stuff that could be stored, you could now store quadrillions of graph items in Neo4j, and the performance bump that we got was just astounding. For developers, we introduced the native language drivers and the Bolt protocol, so that Neo4j feels idiomatic in your language. It feels, you know, like a normal database. So the excitement is in the data model, it's not in how you connect to the database. I have to admit, slight bittersweet moment for me, I built the original Neo4j REST API with a couple other folks in the room, and now I've We've transitioned that out. It's, it's on its last legs. It's slowly, we're slowly weaning ourselves off it. But we're going now with this excellent uh, uh, binary protocol and native driver experience. And then we had a, a really good run with an operability team, a bunch of folks who were just thinking through how to run and operate Neo4j from an end user perspective. I think you'll agree that like, if you've picked up uh, uh, any of the 3.x series, they're just a lot more straightforward to get up and running uh, and to push all the way into production. 3.1, we are in, you know, kind of doubled down on this kind of enterprise foundation theme. We introduced a, a proper uh, security model into Neo4j. We introduced a brand new clustering architecture into Neo4j. And again, we doubled down on that operability stuff. So uh, with Neo4j 3.1, you could now run a, a secure, uh, uh, safe, dependable uh, environment and operate it relatively simply. So it took some of the friction out of that. Uh, all the fun stayed in the graph model and not in operating it itself. In 3.2, we are covering off three things. So large scale for internet facing apps. You've seen several of these today. Emil mentioned uh, ShopBot this morning. We're doubling down on governance for enterprise scenarios. So uh, things like uh, a Kerberos, uh, node keys and so on. And we've got an absolute uh, uh, bag of fun little performance improvements that just keep Neo4j going in the right direction. So in terms of uh, large-scale apps, uh, we introduced causal clustering in 3.1. Causal clustering now stretches across DCs. It's topology aware. So if you've got a multi-data center app, because you've got some like, you know, widely uh, dispersed geography that you're serving, for example, or a highly redundant system, Neo4j 3.2 understands that topology. And actually, uh, the uh, causal clustering architecture and the driver's architecture work sympathetically towards that. So for example, it will enable you to route to the nearest uh, uh, server that's suitable for your needs. Or if you're prepared to uh, get stuck in and, and extend the API, you could do things like route to the lightest loaded server or the, the server that's running least queries or the one that has the most RAM or anything. We've also uh, 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 provided cloud delivery. So if you are on one of the popular clouds on uh, AWS or EC2, there are now, uh, we're now available there very, very conveniently. In terms of the, the governance stuff, we now have a new kind of schema component, which uh, Philip introduced this morning uh, around node keys. Um, 
we've also got Kerberos support for those of you, particularly in the financials, who find that they just can't live without Kerberos. Uh, there are a few people who are like, yeah, I can't live without Kerberos, and everyone else in the audience is like, what's a Kerberos? Uh, I'm in the latter category, but it does seem terribly important. We also now have made available uh, causal clustering on the IBM CAPI flash stack, so we had to do a bit of work there uh, to make that work. And there's a bunch of really other, really other, a bunch of other really lovely affordances around you know, better metrics to, to uh, monitor queries and so on, so that's lovely. The continuous uh, performance theme uh, is there. So we've now got a native uh, a label index. So we're starting to uh, wean ourselves off the technical dependency on Lucene. Lucene is a wonderful, wonderful general purpose indexing framework. But over time, we've noticed that we can build things that are specific for graph workloads, that's native for graph workloads, that are just that bit better, that bit faster, that bit less resource hungry. So you're starting to see this now when you're in your deployments as as faster queries, as, low, as lighter footprint on the machines that you're deploying on. We've also seen that Cypher now has the beginnings of, the, uh, of a new compiled runtime. We've seen uh, enormous improvements in Cypher itself. Uh, and I think this is all possible, you know, because we can do all of these things up and down the Neo stack, because we are at each level of the stack native for the graph workload. It's the thing that we prioritize above everything else. So whenever we're considering what advances we can make, we always do that within the context of a graph, because Neo4j is a native graph database. Consider the elephant. <laughs> Legend has it that it has a memory so robust it never forgets. So zooming out a little bit, I actually think that memory is becoming interesting. Who, in their younger days, built PCs because it was cheap and fun and amazing? Uh, everyone did this, right? It, it, even Nikki Watt did this. She sort of sheepishly didn't want to fess up. Uh, she said, yeah, I did. Uh, oh, yeah, me too, me too. And then who do, who's done it as a grown-up? Oh, wow, you guys are hardcore, not me. Nigel's here. He's like, yeah, well, I come from it's the only option. They don't deliver to rural Kent. Um, <laughs> I, I imagine he has some kind of stig of the dump thing going on where he has to scavenge for like VGA cards or something. Hercules cards where you live, right, Nigel? Um, but actually, um, good for you for still building this stuff and still like being interested because it turns out that computer architecture, in fact, computer memory has got really, really interesting. I, I showed you this slide a year ago for those of you who were here. And my remark then was, and I'll ask the same question again, who knows where the source of truth is in a modern computer architecture. If I write a value from a CPU, who knows where that source of truth is? When does it become available for everyone else to read? In RAM? Stick your hand up. Ah, oh, trick question. Of course it's not in RAM. Everyone knows that since 2012, on the Intel chipset, the source of truth is L2 cache. I know, right? We all thought you got to write a value to RAM, and then some like, clever machinery happens, and oh, look, and then every other thread can read it in RAM. No, L2 cache. This means a couple of things. One, all the software you've ever written since 2012 is wrong, particularly if you're on the JVM, right? Because the memory model is such that you're thinking it's written in RAM. It's not. So cleverly, Intel have this architecture and the other, the other competitors have similar kinds of things going on, where, where once a value is out of the right buffer and into L2 cache, it's visible to all cores, all threads can see it. This means that you, if you can stay in the realms of L2 cache, which is super, super fast, you can get a lot done. If you stray out of L2 cache, you start to get penalties. 500 nano penalties, for example, you know, where you're CPU is just twiddling its thumbs, metaphorically speaking. It doesn't actually have thumbs. It's a chip, right? It's a metaphor. <laughs> so if you can optimize for L2 cache, you can absolutely do things that are blazingly fast performance. So in the J3.0, when we introduced the enterprise high limit format, the thing that gives you these quadrillions of items of storage in, in the database, we achieved that by doing relative pointers by having shorter pointers. Rather than having absolute pointers, we had relative pointers. And these smaller pointers, you can fit more of them into L2 cache. Why is this important? Why am I talking to you about pointers? I mean, how many of you are having core dump nightmares at this point? Because I've said the P word. Uh, there's a few gray beards like, oh. 
bad times. Why? Because actually, the way Neo4j gets its amazing performance is that it dereferences pointers. It does pointer chasing through the graph in order to traverse the structure. It doesn't do any like crazy joins of sets or you know, log n lookups of document indexes. It just chases pointers. Computers are really good at chasing pointers. It's what they do, right? And if you can give the computer access to pointers in the fastest part of memory, they'll do it really, really fast. So in accommodating large graphs, we were also able to target, th target this part uh, of the modern computer architecture and make sure that we can get great value out of L2 cache. Now, another thing that's happened with respect to memory is the kind of confluence of these folks' work. So Silad Pafka, writing at datascience.la, and Yuri Leskovic, writing at the rather more academic grades workshop last year, they both made some very interesting observations. So Silad's observation is that despite the fact that we live in a realm of big data, and I'm quite willing to believe that you know, there is a lot more data around globally than there ever has been before, but individually, you know, a lot of us are kind of a, let's see if this works. Oh, doesn't work. Oh, it works. Ooh, gadget. Lots of us are kind of around, you know, gigascale data. Uh, relatively few of us are a kind of, you know, at petascale or, or major terascale. Uh, I'm quite, I'm quite, you know, I, I believe that there's loads of data around. It's just that we've all got some, and most of it is gigascale or terascale. It's not necessarily petascale yet. So that's interesting. So we live in a kind of terascale world. Most of us live in a terascale world. Leskovich has done some analysis on the KD Nuggets uh, surveys all the way back to 2006. And he's asking about the largest data set that you worked with. And his analysis reveals something really interesting. Uh, the, the yearly increase in the size of RAM is running at about 50%. The yearly increase in the size of this working data is about running about 20%, implying that at some point the lines might cross, or certainly they're going to get close. And so what Leskovich is saying is the bottom line is if you want to do graph analytics, get a big machine. Get, and if you're working at terra scale, get a, terra, get a terabyte, get a 12 terabyte, get a 16 terabyte RAM machine. For you and I as individuals, you'd be like, oh, we're going to spend you know, half a million dollars on one of these fancy machines with 12 terabytes of RAM. And half a million dollars sounds like a lot of money, right? I think we'll all agree, I'd like half a million dollars. Is that, yeah, just as my witnesses? D yeah, don't run it past the COO, come on, man up. Uh, but actually, for many of us in the businesses we work in, half a million dollars is the loaded cost of a few developers. Now, would you take the risk of taking those same few developers and saying, oh, figure out how to aggregate large pools of RAM from commodity machines? Or would you just say, actually, the low business risk path here is to just buy or rent one of those machines with 5 or 10 or 16 terabytes of RAM at about the same cost, right? So it turns out that these, this machinery that I think is like space age and expensive is actually sort of compatible with developer salaries. Now, I'm not at all advocating that developers should be replaced with machines. That would be foolhardy, given that I've just asked for half a million dollars. But it does mean that we have some choices. Does this mean that we should have relatively small clusters of very large machines? And the answer is maybe, depending on the use case. Does it mean that we should have very large clusters of quite small machines? And again, maybe. It depends on the use case. For example, if you had small clusters of large machines, that's really convenient because you've got a lot of RAM in one place. You can do some very heavy analytics very conveniently on that. But if you lose one of those machines, it's a bit annoying, right? Because you've got to kind of restore several terabytes from uh, neighboring machines or disk or whatever. So, you know, kind of uh, uh, oopsies are slightly more annoying. If you've got a, a large cluster of small machines, then you tolerate outages all the time because if you've got thousands of machines, they're going to be coming and going all the time. But you've got the slightly less convenient model of having many disparate uh, 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 memory spaces that you're aggregating together through software. The point here is that because Neo4j is graph native, because Neo4j owns the whole stack, we can actually accommodate either of those scenarios. So whether you are going to be deploying on a handful of large, very impressive machines, or you're going to be deploying on many far less impressive machines, 
Neo4j can adapt to that environment. So we're actually going to, you know, in using Neo4j, you get the freedom to pick the hardware that you want. And it isn't anymore, much to my surprise, it isn't anymore simply a matter of dozens or hundreds of blades. Computer hardware is moving on, and as software people, as I guess many of us are, we'd be well advised to keep abreast of that trend, right? To that end, by Equinara lad, we had a 20 megabyte disk, and we were glad of it. Winter is coming, etc. Disks are changing. 2016, Seagate announced a 60 terabyte SSD. Now, if you remember uh, Sillard's work, most of us are at TerraScale. So this is a single disk that can contain your data problem and my data problem. I mean, you are going to have to have a fair amount of data in order to fill a 60 terabyte SSD. That's a lot of space. So that's really interesting, right? Um, because now Neo4j uh, after 3.0 can store quadrillions of items, you can take one of those very fancy disks and you can store an awful lot of graph in it. So actually the hardware, which of course, oh, it stopped scaling vertically years ago, goes common sense. No, the hardware actually is scaling vertically rather amazingly. And many of us, myself included, until you start to dig in, we're not seeing it, but it is there. The hardware guys are innovating, and we can take full advantage of that. Now, sure, this 60 terabyte SSD is super expensive, and it's not for everyone. But again, for some use cases where you're going to be trading off, hmm, do I put in a bunch of developer effort to kind of make several smaller disks aggregated into one, or do I just go and buy one of these things? Sometimes buying one of these expensive things is the right thing to do. And again, you and I are going to be surprised. Oh, my God, it's like $30,000 for a disk. That's crazy. Actually, that's what you spend in coffee in your department on a typical quarter, right? It's not crazy. These numbers are crazy for individual humans. They are not at all crazy for the kind of businesses, the organizations that we serve. And Neo4j can take advantage of this, again, because we're native all the way down to the hardware. So... Shifting gear a little, my colleague Max DeMarzi wrote probably about a year and a bit ago now a really, really good blog post about benchmarks, and it triggered some really interesting thoughts for me. I, in Max's uh, blog post, he points out that often uh, people will do bake-offs or benchmarks by bringing up you know, your, your benchmarked software, if you have Neo4j, for example, running a query on it, timing it, shutting down. Or if you're being super scientific, after all, I am chief scientist, I do have to display some credentials. You'll bring it up, you'll run several queries, and you'll take the average, and then shut it down. <laughs> That's how science works, people. <laughs> Don't forget your error bars. Um, actually, what Max pointed out, and uh, Max is a, a fairly excitable character, so I, I can only imagine he did this in a delightfully angry way, which is, that's ridiculous. No one actually has a production database of any flavor which they bring up, run the query 10 times, and shut down. If you ha is that your job? That's super weird, right? What do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, I, I, I've, just, I've got a fake database cluster that I run 10 queries on and measure it. That's a weird job. I've had some weird jobs. I've been a management consultant. That's the weirdest. Actually, what do you guys do? You bring up a cluster of machines, you run them for a period of hours, days, weeks, months, years, and then you've got a certain throughput that you know that that cluster can ascertain, that can, uh, can achieve. Max pointed that out. I think that's a really useful thing to point out. He also pointed out why Neo4j can do this on relatively uh, uh, modest amounts of hardware. And it's because Neo4j is optimized for graphs. In a... In Neo4j, as I mentioned a moment ago, most of the work is done by pointer chasing, super cheap pointer dereferencing, especially if you can stay in the fast parts of the memory hierarchy. So actually, we need relatively few index lookups. Typically, in Neo4j index lookups are used to find starting points in the graph, and then all of the, if you like, the hard work, the traversal work, is done by traversing that graph structure. If you've got a non-native database and you're trying to mimic graphs, the way you typically do it is by faking graph structure in an index. And that, you know, at first sight, that seems okay. All right? So I can create these indexes that kind of reify out some intended structure. The difference is that when you're then traversing by index lookup, you're doing lots of them. You're doing lots of log n lookups. 
In Neo4j, we do relatively few index lookups, so relatively few of the costly things. In a non-native database, you do one of those lookups potentially for each traversal, which means you're doing lots of log n lookups. And if you've got a large n, if you've got a large database, you know, millions, billions, hundreds of billions, that log n quickly ramps up until you're doing an absolute ton of IO, 10x more IO, 12x more IO than you actually need if you had a na a a a an index-free adjacency structure. Index-free adjacency meaning that if I've got a node and its relationships, I can immediately transit at constant cost to the neighbors. Index-free adjacency is a term uh, initially coined in 2010 by Marco Rodriguez and Peter Neubauer. And in my mind, that's what defines, it's one of the defining elements of a native graph database, that the cost of going from one across a relationship between nodes is constant. Meaning that even if you've got a large, you know, terabyte, multi-terabyte, hundreds of terabytes data set, the cost of that one traversal remains the same. Not so in the native world if you're, if you're, if you're uh, uh, banking on using indexes for this. As your data set size grows, the cost of traversal also grows. If you're in the relational world and you're faking this with a join table, as the size of your data sets grows, the latency of your query grows. And worse, at each hop, as you're doing those joins, the latency of your query goes. You might get away with one hop, two hops, three hops, four hops. Ooh, took a bit longer there. Five hops. Now, this is artistic license, but the five hops will finish in a minute. How are you guys doing? Having a good time? Just waiting for my fifth hop to return. What's happened is that there's a Cartesian product of sets that's gone on. And it's, uh, I think what's really happening is it's, um, it's spilled out of RAM, and it's kind of paged out to virtual memory. And virtual memory is wonderful, right? Because it gives me the illusion of infinite memory. But it's a bit slow compared to like, you know, L2 cache or even RAM. So I've got, it's sort of embarrassing. I'm supposed to be given a keynote, and now all these people are waiting for my fifth hop to come back. And the set's massive. And I thought I'd given it enough RAM. And I've got to tell you, right, my DBAs even did some insane indexing on this stuff. They did the bitmap, yada, yada, index, the, the, uh, my, my, my favorite, the sacrifice goat to Satan index. They did everything. Oh, it's back. OK, great. So you can see there that it's actually really difficult to predict the latency of those indexes. It leads to awkward interludes where you have to have intimate chats with unwilling people in the front row, right? because of those things. So actually, if you're going to go this way, it's going to cause you pain. Don't. Pick native graph tech. It's good for, it's good for graph workloads. It's optimized all the way down for graph workloads. This is the confluence of the Green River and the Colorado River. It's a lovely, lovely part of the world, um, assuming there's not a wall built across it at some point soon. <laughs> but actually, there's a more interesting confluence that's happening in the memory hierarchy of our computers. And that is that primary uh, memory, RAM, and secondary memory, disk, are merging. We're already starting to see non-volatile RAM coming. It's coming our way. And sure, non-volatile RAM may be slower than real RAM. It might be you know, 4x slower than real RAM. But it's 10 times the capacity and when you switch the power off, it doesn't go away, which is nice. So this is a really interesting uh, affordance for us, right? Neo4j today has an in-memory representation of a graph, which is optimized for in-memory traversals. And it has an on-disk representation of the graph, which is optimized for on-disk traversals if we ever miss uh, something from memory, if we have to go down to disk. Which means that sometimes we have to shuffle and translate between formats. Should non-volatile RAM become a... Uh, a sufficiently widespread thing, we can change that. We can just have one format inside Neo4j that lives in memory in the non-volatile RAM, obviating the need for kind of translations and stuff. Super interesting, right? We can do this, why? Again, because we own the stack all the way down. We know what a graph means up at the Cypher world, up in Cypher world, we know what a graph means down on disk, and therefore we know what a graph means in memory. So we can optimize for that stuff all the way down. When non-volatile RAM comes out, my colleague in the front row, Johan, is all over that. Indeed, we're already seeing innovations along this line. So IBM have this uh, Power8 architecture. And I think what's really interesting about Power8 is that it does for IO what we've all been used to seeing for graphics. So we are quite comfortable with the idea of a GPU 
being used to offload graphics intensive or matrix intensive workload from the CPU to some more specialized machinery. And I think what, what's interesting about Power 8 is that it's introduced the notion of like an I.O. coprocessor. So you'll, I've got some specialized machinery for I.O. so that you can get enormous gains when you're doing that kind of I.O. This means that you can, you know, even today, you could, uh, you know, pockets permitting, you could grab a machine from IBM which has something in the region of 56 terabytes of extremely fast, stable storage, and actually a, a shed load of RAM too, 16 terabytes. So if you want to do some of these large graph operations that, uh, that, that, that Yuri Leskovich says uh, uh, that, you, that we might want to do, this is the sort of hardware that you might want to choose for it. So what can Neo4j do? So you know, often people will ask in a, uh, people ask uh, for numbers, right? Particularly if you're, if you're you know, trying out Neo4j for the first time, you want to take it to your boss and say, well, Neo4j can do blur and blur and blur. Uh, we can do some numbers. And I actually don't really like that, right? Because kind of raw numbers, they're easy, easy to uh, uh, fake. And they're kind of meaningless because my raw numbers in my lab may not be the same as your raw numbers in your actual production environment, right? So I'd much prefer that you would measure things uh, the way that you would use the database. However, people are insistent. And so Johan, bless him, uh, decided that we would get some numbers. Now, Johan is a lovely, lovely folk, uh, lovely, lovely bloke. He's a sort of chilled out Swedish dude. He's, he's, he's an insult to his Viking ancestors, basically, because there's, there's just not even a shred of kind of like Viking aggression in him. He's this super, super smart, super, super lovely guy. And so he decided that he would uh, he'd build some asymptotic benchmarks on Neo4j. So not, you know, not kind of like real world kind of, uh, you know, all, 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 all caveats abound kind of benchmarks, but just what can we do if we just hammer the database as hard as we can? And what numbers would that give us? So that then when people ask for numbers, we can say, look, here's the asymptote of the performance envelope, and your job is to get as close to that as you can in your real production system. So I do talk to Johan about it. He's down the front here. He's, uh, he looks a lot like this, actually. Uh, and he, and he's, he's very, very friendly. Don't be put off by his Viking ancestry. He's not like that at all. So, uh, that's awkward. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm in a little trouble here, uh, you might have noticed. Um, heart beating rather rapidly. Uh, why don't, look, the way we're going to get through this, we're going to double down, right? We're all going to pretend that we didn't see this, and all of you are going to talk to Johan at the end of this session, <laughs> right? Because if we all pretend we haven't seen this, it didn't exist, so just beat a path to Johan, talk to him about kernel stuff, I.O., disks, memory, everything, because otherwise I'm in a spot of bother. Will you do that for me, boys and girls? Yeah, thank you. Love you. <laughs> so what did Johan do? So he took a realistic retail data set from Amazon, and he took a commodity uh, dual Xeon processor server, and uh, he built a benchmark in Java, but that kind of looked like this cipher. So it's like, database, find me something where, uh, where I bought something, where someone else bought the same thing, and tell me what other thing they bought as a recommendation, and then return that recommendation to me. It's a real uh, kind of straightforward social recommendation. Uh, it's actually, despite its brevity, it is surprisingly a, actually a good thing, a good algorithm anyway, because you know what? You fall for this every time, right? You know this. Did you need, for example, the convenience of not having a headphone jack on your latest phone? No, you did not need that convenience. But the minute someone in your office bought that, you needed that convenience because we are weak and frail humans, all of us, terribly weak and frail humans. So this actually is not a bad algorithm. But what can we do once we start blasting through it? Well, Actually, some interesting things happen. On a single thread, you get about three to four uh, million traversals per second. On 10 threads, about, you know, kind of thick end of 30 million traversals a second. On 20 threads, starting to get asymptotic now to around, peaking around 50 million traversals a second. And on 30 threads, we, we really are entering that asymptotic uh, part of the chart now, around 60 million traversals per second on this hardware. Actually... This isn't bad, right? I mean, I realize this is the deliberately asymptotic uh, result set, but if you had 
you know, even 50% of this, if you had the ability in your application, you know, if your asymptote was 50% of this, to traverse 30 million relationships per second, you can explore a lot of graph with that, right? You can explore a lot about me as the individual that's currently logged in, or you can explore a lot of the graph for deeper, more analytic jobs very, very rapidly. So the raw power here, I think is pretty good, right? So then we went a little bit further. It's like, okay, well, what can we currently, what can we conveniently handle uh, on a disk? So we cobbled together uh, a 48 terabyte disk out of 24 two terabyte disks. And Johan just hammered Neo4j, hammer, 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 hammer. That's more, that's not, it's a metaphorical hammer, right? I mean, actually hitting the data, not helpful, not helpful slightly. So you've got a trillion relationships on disk. Then you can do a user, a compiled cipher query, which represents some kind of realistic end user interaction. And on that size of disk, you can, on that size of set, you can sustain about 100,000 user interactions per second. So to put that in more kind of, you know, a frame of reference that we're more used to, you could perhaps look after the thick end of 100,000 users off this server every second, which is kind of order of magnitude of some of the folks we've seen today, like the ShopBot guys, like the, the big retail recommendation guys, and so on. And this actually was with um, a setup that was not at all respectful of the memory hierarchy, so he mostly got page faults. So he was still having to go out to these SSDs rather than operating, because of the random nature of the, of the activity, he was still having to go out to SSDs to get this, because he had a modest 512 gigabytes of RAM machine. Uh, if you think 512 gigabytes of RAM is not modest, the amount of money we had to pay for this 16 gigabyte laptop, I deserve 512 gigabytes for that. It should be a commodity, mediocre laptop. That's trillions. Uh, I should point out that that's not an actual celebrity endorsement. I should definitely point that out because Professor Brian Cox did actually speak at the MongoDB conference, so I don't want to ride on their coattails ever. Anyway, so then we thought, well, you know, what can we do in terms of writing? So we imported the highly connected Friendster uh, data set. It's about 1.8 billion relationships. Takes about 20 minutes to import on, on that hardware. That's about a million writes per second. You can do a lot of work with a million writes a second, right? That's really not bad at all. That's millions. Thanks, Brian. Still not an actual celebrity endorsement, in case you were wondering. That's, these are astonishing figures. Let me put that in numerical form. You get a million writes a second, over a billion records, and 50 million traversals a second. You can get a lot done with this, right? These are the raw numbers on relatively modest hardware, and your job is simply to eat up as far as you can into these asymptotic limits and get real impactful business stuff done in your app. I just have to point out, I just think, you know, this just, to me, screams strong and stable database. <laughs> strong and stable database. This is a strong and stable database. This is a strong and stable. I don't know how she can do it. I've got to tell you, this is. Uh, I'm, but this is. A, <laughs> uh, would it would it be? Is it wrong to put a picture of a Neo4j customer and her current slogan on a GraphConnect keynote? If it is, I don't want to know. Um, so look, we can do all of this because the whole stack is graph native. There's never any, you know machinery under the covers that's not aligned with the graph workloads you want to throw at it. Every bit of our stack is absolutely aligned for doing graph things. Native for graphs, top to bottom, and that's the way we're always going to keep it. No matter what hardware innovation comes that way, that's our promise to you. And the graph nati native advantage is that um, we can adapt at any point. We can, we can adapt for uh, fancy, fancy or large disks. We can adapt for non-volatile RAM. We can adapt for coprocessors. We can adapt for uh, RDMA, so re remote memory access. We can adapt the, the query language. We can do all kinds of clever stuff there because the query language understands graph. None of this is available to you if you've got a graph API on top of some non-graph store. The non-graph store, it's always going to favor its primary use case. They're not going to put machinery in it to deal with their secondary or third or fourth use case, which might be graphs as a hobby. So, we've seen that Neo4j is not a slow coach. I mean, you know, Johan's asymptotic benchmark tells us that. 
So how does it compare to a, a, a non-native model? Well, a few months ago, I saw um, some folks who build a non-native graph database on the internet. They've got a, like a graph API onto a, a column store. And they'd produced some benchmarks. And I thought, oh, those are interesting. Those are pretty interesting. And uh, pretty big cluster. So six, six machine cluster with 48 virtual CPUs, 256 gigs of disk and RAM. So terabyte and half of RAM, nearly 300 CPUs, um, you know, Reasonable amount of disk. Pretty, I've uh, got to say, if I'd built that cluster, I'd be feeling pretty, uh, pretty macho. I'd have a bit of cockney neck going on, definitely. That's for the locals. Ah, it's pretty cool, right? Big manly cluster. Big manly cluster right there. Pretty amazing. And so we, they, they did some experiments. They did some kind of graph analytics experiments. Um, so they counted the number of nodes in the graph. And the, the graph they had was a, a synthetic 10 million node 100 million relationships, scale-free kind of graph. And uh, yeah, so you know, they, they did a bunch of stuff. And I thought, wow, I wonder, I, I genuinely didn't know. Um, I wonder how this works out on Neo4j, actually. Because yeah, we're graph native, and so you kind of hope that we'd be able to be ballpark comparable with some of these numbers. I, I'm sort of a little bit embarrassed to say that we, we were not ballpark comparable with these numbers. For example, in counting nodes, we were at least 200,000 times faster. For counting relationships, we were at least 200,000 times faster. For count outgoing rels at depth two, we were 10 times as fast. For count outgoing rels at depth three, well, okay, we were a bit faster. For grouping nodes together by a particular property value, we were four or five times faster. For counting depth to nose and likes patterns, twice as fast. And for you know, the ultimate graph uh, uh, ego trip page rank, we were, well, let's say 100 times faster there. And when I kind of discussed this amongst my, my, my colleagues in engineering, it, something very, very important came out. They said, well, actually, Jim, this is not a fair comparison. Oh, well, tell me, a hypothetical Neo4j engineer, why is this not a fair comparison? So look, Jim, these guys actually have to do a bunch of work to count the nodes in the graph. They have to do some kind of store scan or hop around the graph. They have to do actual work. But we just look in the node store, and, we, and there's a number there that tells us how many things are in, how many nodes are in the graph, or how many relationships in the graph. So how is that fair? Like, it's not fair. You're right, hypothetical Neo4j engineer. It's not fair at all. It's because we're native for graphs. So we've prioritized the fact that the user might want to do some of these common graph operations, and we make them super, super cheap. So yeah, if you want to say that we're cheating, you're wrong. We're simply native for the kind of operations that people who do graphs want to do. Now, most of these timings come from my laptop. The ones with the asterisk, Michael Hunger ran for me. So I actually joined the realms of most of you in the room for whom Michael Hunger has done their homework. Thanks, Michael. All righty. So we're saying that you know, this small, modest, efficient, graph-native cluster is bigger than my uh, Hooli scale uh, infrastructure. Must be something middle out about it. So. Let's think about the data center of the future. In 3.1, that got released you know, five, five months back, uh, we introduced causal clustering. In fact, I'm super, super proud about that. It was the team that I, I worked on that, that built that software. So I was, I was very uh, pleased and, 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 frankly, relieved that we shipped it. It was a, a, a weight from my shoulders. And causal clustering, kind of cool. Um, there's a few nice things about it. Uh, one of the nice things is that we've got like, separate roles for those things that are intended to keep the data uh, absolutely sacred and safe versus those things that are designed for enormous scale out of graph workloads. I think what was really nice about that also is that the, the drivers that the drivers team built were sympathetic to this, so the drivers would always try to choose the most appropriate server in your cluster to root, to root your current request to. I think that was nice. And I think the thing that was really nice is that we provided this thing called causal consistency, which is a guarantee that you can always read at least your own rights. So we kind of 
you know, we kind of don't really get along with eventual consistency. It's a bit of an awkward uh, model for the developer. There are great benefits to it for the database provider, because we can now claim enormous scale and massiveness and manliness. But eventual consistency does rather leave the ball in the developer's court when it comes to, hey, I've just done a write. Has that write propagated to one of the replicas from which I might read? I don't know. Shall I poll? Shall I sleep? Shall I sleep and poll? Shall I poll and sleep? I don't know. It's a bit of a kind of, uh, bit of a man trap, really, isn't it? What calls of consistency does is it says, actually, should you choose to use it, uh, you, your, any reads that you make will be uh, guaranteed to happen after a particular write that you make. So you never go back in time, never any surprises. From an application development point of view, this means that even working with a very large cluster, it feels like you've got a single memory space. If you do a write, the side effects of that write will be visible in your next read. That seems like such a simple thing, right? You know, I've, got, I've got a bunch of computers that you can write to and read from, but given that causality makes working with a database so much more pleasant. Now, in uh, uh, Neo4j uh, 3.1, we had, had a, a typical multi-DC setup might look like this, where although you can happily deploy machines in a variety of patterns across many of your data centers, topologically, it's flat. And in fact, a given driver session will actually try and round robin uh, uh, amongst uh, and the most appropriate servers for you. He didn't really know uh, anything about this kind of data center topology. It was a little bit opaque. At GraphConnect in San Francisco last year, I boldly said on the stage that, yeah, we're going to fix that, right? We're going to totally fix that and make uh, Neo4j multi-DC aware. And in 3.2, uh, we actually did that, more because I wanted to avoid embarrassing myself than anything, I presume. But we said we're going to do that. And so in Neo4j 3.2, we now have multi-data center support for those kind of large global internet-facing apps. And what it means now is that uh, machines, servers, Neo4j instances in your cluster are very aware of where they are in the topology. You tell them, you configure them, that, hey, you're in this part of the cluster, you're in US East or US West or EU or whatever. Uh, obviously, EU doesn't apply for us for that much longer, but, you know, say la vie. So now, actually, you've got, not only have you got topological awareness within the cluster, but also you can use that same topological awareness from the driver. So the drivers can start to pick the most appropriate geography or data center for you to route requests there. So that's really nice, right? So it, now you can actually uh, uh, introduce concepts like, you know, for example, regions or data centers. You can now also introduce uh, a failover policy, so in this case, if I, use, if I lose too many US East instances, I'm going to fall back to US West, that kind of stuff. So you can start to really get some intelligence into your topology that you couldn't do previously. And hopefully this is going to help you to build uh, even more robust and performant systems on top of Neo4j. Just one more thing. Again, about, I guess, uh, six, seven, eight months ago, I offered an opinion about Cypher. Cypher is marvelous, by the way. It is absolutely stonkingly good stuff. But if you look at this, uh, if you look at this Cypher here, it's actually Cypher that Ian Robinson and I wrote years ago when we used to teach Neo4j as a side effect of teaching Doctor Who. Um, if you look at this, though, even if you, don't, uh, if, you, if you don't understand the domain, which you should, by the way, world's longest running sci-fi show, you can see that there are opportunities here for things to run in parallel, right? You've got a certain level of parallelism uh, within the match clause, and you've potentially even got a level of pipeline parallelism going on uh, with the merge. You can kind of uh, stream things into that merge, potentially. So even as you know, dumb humans, we can kind of see that opportunity. But until this point, Cypher has been uh, built to be single-threaded. And the, the way that you'd get parallelism is that you'd run multiple Cypher queries uh, concurrently, so optimized for an OLTP-style workload. We can do better than that. And in fact, you can optimize for Cypher to uh, take advantage of any number of cores, potentially, uh, on uh, your machine. I mean, Cypher is ultimately represented internally as a tree of operators. It's potentially quite practical to take subtrees of operators and execute them in parallel. So we're working on that. 
we're actually working as part of a, get this, this is the hilarity, an EU-funded consortium. <laughs> I don't know how much longer I'm going to be allowed to say that legally in this country, but we are working with an EU-funded consortium looking exactly at this. So we're working uh, along with uh, three excellent universities and, and some uh, cloud providers, and we are looking now at, look at how to make Cypher not only parallel, so it can consume potentially as many cores as you're prepared to give it for a single query, but also how to make it numer aware. So at advancing the cost model so that Cypher understands the cost of accessing memory that's local to your core versus memory that's local to my core, which should mean that you should be able to do some phenomenal uh, analytic jobs in Cypher because you'll have all the, all the cores and a rational, rationalized memory model available to Cypher that you don't have today. That project started uh, back in January. It's running over the next couple of years. We're collaborating with some really, really lovely people uh, in academia in particular. And you'll start to see the results of this trickling out in the Cypher project as we go along. So one day you will be able to just say, yeah, I'm going to give eight cores to this query because I think it needs the oomph and, and away it will go. So that's pretty cool. All right, so let's recap. Where, where have we been? So in 3.2, the kind of uh, global internet scale app stuff is addressed through causal clustering and the new multi-DC features. In terms of the enterprise governance stuff, we've got Kerberos, we've got node keys, uh, and, a, and a bunch of other uh, useful add-ons there. In terms of the performance stuff, yeah, we've seen that Neo4j is, is, pretty, is pretty quick. Down in the engine room, we're starting to do this work now where we have uh, increasingly uh, more native, graph-native indexes, which will boost both write and read performance. But now that I'm nearing the end of my keynote, those of you that know me may be wondering where the triangles are. I do like a triangle. Well, just as a minor crowd pleaser, there it is. There we go. That is now the conjoined triangles of success, and they do teach that, I understand, at business school. <laughs> Thank you, near for j dev team, for making this happen. You are an absolutely stunning and wonderful bunch of people. And yes, that is... Uh, Front-end developer Mark Peace, age 12, in case you are wondering. He's now 13, it turns out, 13. So look, let's ride this graph unicorn all the way to the after party. Thank you to my slide crew, Alistair Jones and Nigel Small. You gentlemen are wonderful. Let's go and get a drink. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you.